Welcome to Tales from the Waystone, a Starless Interlude. There are seven episodes. This is one of them. It is a quiet morning two days after Christmas, and Will McCullough is anxiously watching Tottenham Hotspur slog through a turgid draw against Wolverhampton Wanderers. He had known this was a likely outcome from the moment the fixture was announced, between Jose Mourinho's overly conservative tactical scheme, the congested festive season, and his well-honed sense of pessimism around his favorite team, he had felt the outcome in his bones. "'Why do you like them if they make you so miserable?' asks Phoenix. She hates to see Will scowl like this. "'Because when they don't eat dodgy lasagna and do something truly great, it makes you feel that much sweeter. If your team can't make you truly miserable, they can't make you truly happy,' Will replies." Suddenly, he pumps his fists in jubilation as Harry Kane threads a perfectly weighted pass to Hyung Min Son, who slots the ball through the legs of Wolves' keeper in the final minute of stoppage time to seal an improbable victory. Case in point. I see. Well, when you get done celebrating the upending of the natural order, would you please go get us some coffee and breakfast? I'm starving, and we have a podcast to record. <laughs> <laughs> You didn't watch it this morning. <laughs> it hasn't started yet, but I, I know that this is what will happen. Is it what will happen? Probably. So we're doing this out of order. And when are you going to watch this? Well, it's at 11.15 when the game starts. I figured that this fictionalized conversation, though, would set the mood. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> or alienate all the people who don't like football. Uh, that's their problem. The right people will like it. Fair enough. If you don't like this, apparently you're the wrong person. Yep. Sorry. But hopefully you find Will's antics just as charming as I do. I mean, there is an entirely other possible future where none of this comes to pass. Yes, there is. All right. With that, <laughs> let us get into the subject matter of this podcast, which is not football, but books. Specifically, Aaron Morgenstern's The Starless Sea. Though, before we begin, we should do our little disclaimers. First of all, we're in no way affiliated with Aaron Morgenstern or her publisher, Anchor Books. And as always, please be kind to us, to yourself, and the authors responsible for the books you love. With that, uh, let's dive in. So this week, we will be covering pages 170 through 250 of the U.S. paperback edition of The Starless Sea. We start things off with our first encounter with the Owl King, a figure who's been mentioned briefly as the owl that ate the eyes of fate earlier in the fate and time fall in love stories that we've been hearing hints of and variations on. That's kind of gruesome. Yeah, in sort of a Grimm's fairy tales way. If you haven't read the original text, or more accurately, the translated text of the original text, some of those maybe aren't children's stories in the way that you think that they are. They certainly wouldn't pass for modern children's stories. Right, with the hungry caterpillar and what else do children like? I don't know. Like Dr. Seuss or Where the Wild Things Are. When Grimm's fairy tales were first being introduced, childhood, as we perceive it, really wasn't a concept. Children were considered just to be tiny adults, and so they had better just get on with a bleak world. And the sooner that you introduce them to the harshness of it, the better. Well, some of those fairy tales most definitely are harsh. I think we've gone on at length about this before, so let's not. So anyway, back to the Owl King. It starts with a sweet love story between a runaway princess and a local blacksmith. And it quickly devolves into kind of real life, but also fantastical real life, where their love story is a flash in the pan, and then the rest of it is he dies. They have a child. The child is weird. Must take the child to the abandoned castle on the hill that no one goes to because it's spooky. And then in the castle, the little girl encounters some friendly ghosts, which I thought was really charming. I know. I like it when we subvert expectations 
She's not afraid of ghosts. She has conversations with dead people. And the ghosts treat her like one of their own. They have a really sweet little friendship. They cheer her on when she touches the Owl King's golden feather. And they root for her success. Like, we should all be so lucky to be surrounded by ghosts who wish us well. <laughs> yes. And then time passes and the girl's mother has taken her away and gone and said, uh-uh, no, that didn't happen. No, wait, what? No. So after the mother passes, the girl not knowing what else to do, returns to the castle and her ghost friends and the Owl King. And then we're presented with three alternate versions of what happened. One, she just disappears. Two, she gets killed. And then in the third variant, she returns to the castle, returns to her ghost friends, reunites with the Owl King, and stays there willingly as a guest and as a friend of the castle. Kind of reminds me a little bit of how the ending of Clue went. At least the home release. Because it says, that's what could have happened. But how about this? I think it also calls back to the oral tradition, where you have all of these variations on a story. Like in some versions of Little Red Riding Hood, for instance, they're relatively happy. She arrives in time with the huntsman, they take care of the wolf, they save grandmother, and that's that. Other times it's a little more gruesome, where first the wolf eats grandma, and then takes grandma's place, eats little red, and then the huntsman comes and while the wolf is asleep, cuts the wolf open, takes grandma and little red out, sews the wolf back up with rocks in its stomach, and then watches it drown. Okay. Yeah, uh, that's, uh, <laughs> that's one of those things that happens. Again, not necessarily what we would associate as four children. And really what that illustrates, though, in this case, is the way that these stories have different endings depending on who's telling them. And there's not really an authoritative version. There's just different versions that it might have been. I mean, these are fiction, so... What's the true ending? Well, the true ending is whatever the current storyteller says it is. That's a good point. Comes back to the kind of death of the author a little bit. We have sanitized a lot of these stories. And who's to say that those stories now sanitized are not the true story? Yeah, I mean, like, take Pinocchio. I think you've actually talked about Pinocchio before. I'm remembering a conversation we had about this, so I think we're good. Okay, cool. So after this interlude, Zachary and Mirabelle arrive back on the surface after a brief stop in the elevator where she gives him that magical candy story. That's so enchanting to me. The idea that you can have this fleeting, almost an Altoid that, I mean, if you want to take it a different way, drug that just dissolves on your tongue and tells you a story in your head. So it's not really telling you a story but you're not really experiencing the story. I don't know. But it sounds magical and lovely. And it plays into that romanticism that we've got around books and tea and cats and hotels. It fits so well in this story. It also, I think, calls to mind how these sense memories that we have outside of just being told something can really call things back. Like the way memory can be called back by a scent or a taste or a, the feeling of a touch on your skin. Or a photograph. Yeah. It's almost like the memory of this story is bound into the mint. And here Zachary is getting to experience it that way. And something that no one else will experience. Because it's not like these are mass produced. How could they be? Although we will limit our use of the M word here going forward. That is to say magic, because Mirabelle doesn't like it. <laughs> I am held to no such pact. <laughs> so once they get back up, they arrive in a bookstore, which seems a lot to me like Powell's in Portland. I love the imagery. I can super see that being Powell's in Portland. Oregon, not Maine. Although Portland, Maine is quite delightful from all I hear. Before they can make their way back to the Collector's Club to save Dorian, 
They need to stop for coffee. I mean, it's cold. Having something warm against your hands, super amazing and lovely. I mean, I just watched your dad get himself a mug full of hot water just so that he could put his hands around it and drink it. No tea, no coffee, no nothing. Just hot water because his hands were cold. There is something about being able to warm yourself on a cup. Now, of course, Mirabelle has an ulterior motive for going to get coffee as well, which is specifically she wants information. And nice use of, don't you order off of the secret menu at Starbucks? And Zachary saying, like the hipster thing of, I don't drink Starbucks. And then she's like, that's funny. You have an order at the ready for Starbucks. Yeah, I mean, we live in an area where there are bountiful hipster alternatives to Starbucks. And yet, they're not always convenient. So you always know what you're going to get when you go to Starbucks. Is it always going to be the best thing you've ever tasted? Probably not. But it will be serviceable as a caffeine delivery mechanism. Yes, everyone knows Starbucks burns their coffee. But that doesn't seem to stop the majority of us from going there. Anyway, back to the secret menu. Mirabelle gives her name as Zelda. And naturally, Zachary asks, is that a reference to Fitzgerald or the princess? Okay, so I have a fun story that I really, really need to tell. I have been, I don't know if the right word is bothering you or like, teasing you or what for the fact that you never really played any Legend of Zelda games like ever despite the fact that we own a bunch it's just something you never did well yeah my parents got caught up in the satanic panic of the 80s and 90s and believed that such things as Legend of Zelda Magic the Gathering D&D, what have you, were all mechanisms for witchcraft. Which is hilarious because my childhood was essentially Legend of Zelda, Magic the Gathering, and a desire to play D&D, but the only group that I knew of was full. That's sad. I know. So yeah, I never really got into Legend of Zelda. Not for lack of wanting to, mind you, just because my parents wouldn't let me play. And he hasn't discovered the love for it yet as an adult, which I find so, so sad. And if we weren't so stuck on playing Hades constantly at this point, I might sit him down in front of Breath of the Wild. But the best part about this story is that for Christmas, Will's parents got us Hyrule Warriors Age of Calamity. They got us a Legend of Zelda adjacent game. <laughs> and I made fun of them for this. <laughs> At which point we had the conversation that we've had nearly every year since I started dating you, I think. <laughs> which is, Will brings up that his dad and his mom were caught up in the satanic panic problem and never let him play. And it stunted his video game growth. And them saying, oh, come on now, we never did that. All I know is Zelda's the boy, right? <laughs> That's how you start a fight in five words. <laughs> yes. Of course. Imp. <laughs> so moving on. Mirabelle looks on the bottom of her cup, and lo and behold, there is a numerical combination. So I guess there's like this secret order of Starbucks baristas that keep track of secret codes? I don't know. This is all very clandestine to me. Well, she is making her own story. So they get back to the Collector's Club. To rescue Dorian. And lo and behold, the code on the bottom of the cup works to get them in the front door. Now, it kind of sounds a little like one of those realtor box locks is on this door that needs to be unlocked that way rather than being a key, which is kind of funny to me considering how many keys are mentioned in this book. Well, it is a key. It's just 
not a physical one. True. Next, we have another interlude, and this is about the inn at the edge of the world. And it's about an innkeeper who encounters a mysterious woman who arrives at his inn in the middle of winter during the worst storm of the year. And this entire little interlude is just really cozy to me. Yeah. It's about loving companionship between two people. Even though they just met, or it seems they just met, the cozy fire, the overstuffed chairs, the blankets, the warmth against the cold of winter. That's the kind of thing that drew me to The Bear and the Nightingale, which is another amazing book that everyone should read. Especially if you like fairy tales and are not necessarily familiar with Russian fairy tales. Along the way, they do special things with one another of cooking together, telling each other stories, and generally enjoying the quiet until one day another traveler stops by. And it turns out that this traveler has been looking for the first. And the two of them meet. They share conversation. And the innkeeper's a little bit left out for the first time. Yeah, it's sad. His new friend is not really paying attention to him at this point. There is a feeling, definitely, of, but I want to get to know you better, and I want to spend all my time with you. This is giving me the serotonin feedback that I really crave and want right now. Especially in the dark coldness of winter, it's nice to have company. And while there's romance here, what I really love about this is the companionship that they share, where it's two people just enjoying one another's presence, being with one another, and doing something like baking bread, which is not inherently romantic, but just... Doing something with someone else, it has that really pleasing and cozy feeling. It's the sort of thing that reminds me of some of those pleasant times that you and I have spent together. It's this quiet, comfortable, companionable love. And there is no substitute for that in the world. Well, recently I managed to bake cinnamon rolls, except they're not cinnamon rolls, they're lemon lavender rolls from a recipe that we got together at a kind of night market. And so I'm always enchanted by it. And despite our tiny, tiny kitchen that is inconvenient as all get out to work in, you and I managed to find a way to make them together. You helped keep me on track. You helped me figure out the order of steps that I needed to take as I cobbled together the original recipe with other techniques that I have learned from things like binging with Babish. And it was so lovely to be able to work with you on something like that, to make something together. I had a great time doing that with you too. I could see that my presence was helping you. It was helping to ease some of the loneliness that is inherent in this time of the year. And it was helping to quiet some of the anxieties and general malaise that has been ever present in 2020. (laughs) At the same time, it was also just good to do something constructive together. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to lie. The fact that they turned out absolutely fantastically didn't hurt either. I was very happy and pleased with how they turned out. Yes. We ate well. (laughs) We did that and baked mac and cheese. Happy Christmas to both of us. So then we get to the reveal in the story, which is that this woman who has traveled to the inn is not simply a normal human being, but is actually the moon. What is it with us and stories that have a metaphorical moon that may also be a person? Well, the moon is kind of universal because no matter where you live on Earth, on a clear night, you can see the moon when it's out. So the moon shows up in cultures all over the world, as does the sun. It's implied that the other traveler was the sun. I think there's a romanticism about the moon, the light in the darkness of the night sky. And it's a gentle light. It doesn't overwhelm everything, even when it's at its brightest. It still leaves it dark enough that you can sleep, that you can 
operate with good night vision. It's comforting. So, with that out of the way, we come back to our story in New York as Mirabelle and Zachary enter the Collector's Club and they find Dorian hanging from the rafters. Which, I mean, that's kind of grotesque. I know. it. Ugh. The writing is so gentle most of the time that imagery of a person strung up is kind of incongruous. Suddenly the lights go out and Zachary finds himself separated from Mirabelle and Dorian. When he comes to, he's tied to a chair and in front of him there is a tea service with a pot and two cups. And also the polar bear woman. The one who stole his book and then had it stolen from her. So she is trying to track down sweet sorrows. I think she's also trying to track down fortunes and fables. She's trying to track down all of them because she's got to catch them all. Pokemon? Uh, anyway, thank you for that setup. <laughs> You're welcome. They have a nice little session of intimidation tea. She pours from the teapot into both cups, releases Zachary's hand, his non-dominant hand, and they drink, which is dumb. Because seriously, you should never, ever, ever drink or eat anything that your captors are giving you like that. He just fell victim to one of the classic blunders. <laughs> yes. But in this case, the poison was not in both cups. So Mirabelle saves the day and drags both him and Dorian the heck out of that building. And then we flash to another interlude. This time, it is the story of a swordsmith who crafts this epic sword, which a fortune teller foresees will kill the king. He can't bring himself to destroy the sword, but what he can bring himself to do is make two more and give them to his children so that he is not responsible for whatever happens that kills this king. Oops. One of them gets forged into a ring. Another one gets lost at the bottom of the sea. And the third one, which was given to his daughter, is used to kill the Owl King in a dream. But it's not a violent contest. It almost seems like the Owl King expects this to happen and wants this to happen. It's like these endings are inevitable because they lead to a new beginning. Yeah, and... There's this bit where the youngest child of the swordsmith, his only daughter, has been keeping her father's sword in a case in her library and occasionally practice dueling with it using moves that her brothers taught her. And after her dream encounter, the sword has vanished. And an owl sits atop the case. Creepy. Kind of reminds me a little bit of not just the Raven, but the Simpsons version of the Raven, <laughs> because that was my introduction to that story. <sighs> I watched that when it was brand new. That dates me so, so much. It ages me so, so much. Aging in real time. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, let's continue on. <laughs> we come back to Zachary and... Oh, oh. Actually, I got some stuff out of order because the swordsmith interlude. Sorry, everybody. I'm not going to re-record this. The swordsmith interlude happens right after the lights go out. And then the next couple of pages that are about Zachary and escaping happen after the interlude with the swords. So Zachary watches the lights go out and he feels his bonds being cut. When he comes to, next thing you can see, it's Mirabelle. She's dragging Dorian and asking for some help because he's heavy. They do escape and reach the elevator and go down the hole. But not before Mirabelle commits some light arson using a derringer and some lamp oil. <laughs> and then Fortunes and Fables, the story sculptor. My personal theory is that this is Aaron Morgenstern inserting herself into the story. Because it has the same sort of feel, the story that she's describing, where you have these hidden things folded into seemingly unrelated interludes. 
like the structure of the story that is meant to hide the heart of fate that the mouse has brought really feels a lot to me like the way this entire thing is set up, this entire story, the Starless Sea, is set up. We have seemingly unrelated vignettes that don't appear connected to anything, but they're revealing little hints and clues, and there's dead ends and all sorts of interesting little puzzles built into them. I like this interlude a lot. It does sound like someone who has been writing stories, creating stories, sculpting stories for most of their life, things that will never be read, things that are not meant to be read by any soul other than the person who wrote them, things that are fleeting. A lot of authors have so many ideas and they'll start in on a story and then it'll be done before the story is concluded. They will either lose their passion for the story or discover that the story has no ending, but that's okay. This is like the experience of just needing to get the story out regardless of the audience. And the same thing could be said about how we are pursuing our podcast. The whole point for us is to have fun. And the fact that any of you guys are listening to us is just amazing to us. We don't know many of our audience members. We haven't interacted with a lot of you in person or Twitter or, I mean, pers in person. <laughs> it's 2020. No one is in person right now. But you get what I mean. We don't have a lot of interaction with you on Twitter or on Instagram or Facebook, which are our main ways of communicating with people in the outside. But we hope that we are bringing you joy. Enough of you have listened over and over again and continue to indulge us in our storytelling. And the whole point to us is to have this time together, this camaraderie, this reminiscence, and these discussions about books that we love. And that's fulfilling enough. And I think that that's a wonderful lesson going forward to take from the story sculptor. The next bit of the story we get, we have a short interlude, another place, another time, a now forgotten city, a very, very long time ago. And once again, we return to our pirate and his lady love standing on the shore of the Starless Sea. And the pirate is imagining futures together, sailing and having adventures out among the books and stories. And I think at this point, we see the pirate confronting the fact that things may not turn out the way he hopes they do. And then book three. The Ballad of Simon and Eleanor, The Naming of Things, Part 1. So now we're reintroduced to the little girl who went through the door in the forest. She's been living in one of the harbors for some time, and the keepers have taken to calling her Eleanor. And it describes her strange childhood. And during Eleanor's childhood, we are introduced to a painter. I think it's meant to be Mirabelle. Not sure exactly how all of this fits together. At least not yet. You will. It will all come together. Like I say, I think a lot of this is we're looking at different pieces of a puzzle that are all kind of scattered about. And sooner or later, we'll see how they all fit together by the end. Quite accurate. You know, sometimes stories that are so disjointed can feel disconnected in a bad way. But this story does not. Everything is so enchanting, and while it can't necessarily stand on its own, each vignette feels complete. They're all very evocative. So we come back to Zachary Ezra Rollins, who is now going down the elevator with a pink-haired lady with a gun, who he is pretty sure has just committed arson, and an unconscious man who might be an attempted murderer. Okay. I mean, that's not the weirdest thing he's been involved in at this point. <laughs> no. So just so that everyone is caught up a little bit more, Allegra, who is the polar bear lady, did in fact threaten to kill Zachary's mother during the tea session. And now Zachary is rightfully very frightened 
of all of the implications of what he's gotten himself into. Though, to be fair to him, I don't think there's a way he could have not gotten himself into this. Like, this was an elaborately laid trap designed almost exclusively for him. The other thing about this is Maribel's only way of coping or helping others cope is stories. Do you want another story? No, that's not what I need right now. So I think that that shows the limitations of her emotional intelligence or growth. I mean, we do get the sense, as we'll find out later on, that she hasn't had exactly what you would call a normal childhood. No. So when they get to the bottom of the elevator shaft, they have to do the trials to get Dorian checked in. And Dorian is unconscious. So they do it by proxy. One of them takes the dice, that would be Zachary. And one of them takes the drink, that would be Mirabelle. And we have a nice little conversation about, wait, did everybody do the drink? Well, Zachary did. And apparently no one who does not drink the mysterious liquid gets to stay for very long. Except Mirabelle never had to, because she was born down here. Or at least that's one story. The other alternative is that she was hatched from an egg laid by a Norwegian forest cat. Have you ever actually seen a Norwegian forest cat? They're huge. They are huge. They don't stop growing for like three years after they're born. I have a friend who has two of them. They are uh, magnificent beasts. Yes. They're very pretty cats. They're huge. They're absolutely huge. <laughs> But they are very pretty cats. All full of fur. Yeah, if you ever wanted a dog-sized cat, that's how you get one. <laughs> I mean, speak for yourself. We have a 20-pound cat who is not fat, who is currently still bigger than your brother's puppy. Though I think Cody's going to get bigger than Sokka. Soon. Quite probably. You know, of course, the keeper is a little bit put out, but he puts up with all of this. And finds Dorian a room. Dorian's room is all art deco, whereas Zachary's was kind of antique. I'd say eclectic comfort. And shortly after they get Dorian inside, Zachary passes out. It's like he just fell victim to one of the classic blunders. <laughs> yes, don't drink the tea. Next, we have another interlude with Eleanor. I love this so much because she wears a bunny mask. Yeah, I know that bunnies are one of your favorite animals. A girl is not a rabbit. A rabbit is not a girl. Reminds me of how in our old apartment, there were a lot of rabbits that lived around in the surrounding area. And periodically, when we'd go out for walks in the morning and such, we'd see rabbits and bunnies, you know, hopping through the meadows and the fields and Everything And it always filled you with such joy every time you saw one of them. Yeah, living across the street from a large park in the middle of Redmond, Washington was a lot of fun. There were a lot of bunnies. There were a lot of bunnies. And yeah, every time we saw one, it just lifted your spirits. Like whatever else had happened prior to that day, you felt a little bit happier just having seen a bunny. Bunny! Definitely. <laughs> well, what I love is that Bunny Eleanor is different from regular Eleanor. It reminds me of how when you're a little kid, you try on new identities. Just as a matter of course. Like, today I'm an astronaut. Tomorrow I'm a pirate. The day after I'll be a chef. The day after that, who knows? An archaeologist. Paleontologist. <laughs> when I was little, apparently, according to my dad, I said that I was Rainbow Bright or I was Strawberry Shortcake. These are also dating me. Wonderful references. I'm sure at some point I was She-Ra, the original, because that's how old I am. It's okay. I am too. <laughs> yes, young one. She's kind of got this underfoot presence within the harbor. I think she livens it up even as the elders are grousing, but she goes exploring a lot. Having fallen through a door into the center of the earth didn't stop that impulse. I mean, in for a penny, in for a pound. So Eleanor does something that I would never do to a book. 
she rips out pages she doesn't like and folds them up into stars. And then the cats go and play with the stars and they disappear forever. Some of them winding up, I know, in the dollhouse room. So then we see her make a note in her notebook and then fold it up and slide it under a door. We don't know what's going to happen next with that. And when we get back to Zachary Ezra Rollins, he's slowly coming to as Mirabelle has him light some incense and chastise him for, again, falling victim to one of the classic blunders. She does say, I can't believe you were that stupid. I mean, to be fair, as a grad student in emergent narrative design, it's not exactly like Zachary Ezra Rollins is what you would call a world-weary operator. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, he should have realized that you never, ever, ever, ever trust the other person who is threatening to kill your mother. Do not drink the tea. I don't think he's been reading the right stories. I think if he'd read a good James Bond novel or something, he'd have a little more appreciation for spycraft. You'd think that if he had read or watched The Princess Bride. Anyway, he can be a little bit of a dum-dum. But he lights his incense. He starts to feel better. We get a little bit more about Rhyme, who is the person that we can assume is the acolyte from a previous story interlude. She's the only other person who lives here, and she doesn't speak, but she's ever present and seems to know the place inside out. And then Mirabelle leaves Zachary and Dorian together, mostly so that Zachary can watch over Dorian and be there when he wakes up. Of course, Zachary kind of fancies him. Yeah, I think it's cute. Nice, handsome, older gentleman. Zachary even takes a little tiny peek of Dorian's chest, kind of hoping to see a tattooed sword. But there isn't one. At least not that he can see. Accurate, but there isn't one. And he wonders how much of Sweet Sorrows is fact, and how much is fiction, and how much has simply changed with time. He rebuttons Dorian's shirt, probably for the best, because seriously... Messing with someone who is asleep? Ugh, don't do that. Don't do that. That's such a violation. Don't do that. And then contemplates asking the kitchen for either food or drink or something. And at that point, Dorian wakes up and says, I put your book in your coat. Of course now, Zachary is going to have to go find his book. I realize that He's gone through a bunch of time where he was drunk and when he had a lot of shock problems going on and like he really didn't have the wherewithal to examine his own clothing and he forgot to even include his coat when he went to say, hey, wash my stuff for me, please, kitchen. But not noticing a book in your coat? How little is the book and how soft is the cover? Because if it's not a soft, covered, tiny, thin book... How do you miss that? Either that or, like, Zachary is the pickpocket's dream. Like, I mean, how many times have people been stuffing things in and out of his coat pockets throughout this entire thing? He is oblivious. That is the answer to that question. He has to be. Now that we are done, though, criticizing our main character, I think it is time for us to pick characters that we want to highlight from this section of the book. So who did you pick? I picked the story sculptor. Mm. Aaron Morgan's turn? Maybe. <laughs> I know that that's your pet theory, and I find it very charming. I think it's really wise to do things for doing its sake and not to expect things like compensation or adoration or recognition necessarily from others. I think it's really wise to do things for yourself, to find fulfillment in what you do, regardless of what other people think of it, and also to stick to what is true to you and your heart and your desires, and not let other people unduly influence what you want to make. And that making something for the masses 
isn't always the best choice. I would rather make something for a small select group that gets what I'm trying to do and appreciates it than try to homogenize down to the lowest common denominator to reach the broadest audience. I think that you lose a lot of people doing that. If people can see your passion and see what you're doing for what you're doing sake, if what you're doing is unique or special or something that makes you happy and makes your heart sing, then the right people will recognize it and come to it. It might take a while. And if that audience is tiny, so be it. But to make things that are fleeting is its own kind of magic. To make things that make you happy, but that also make others happy is sort of its own kind of magic. But you should only be doing that if that action brings you joy. Trying to make sure that you're making the audience that appreciates you for you happier and pick out the things that you have done that make everything better is different than trying to appease the masses. And so the encouragement that she got from her audience to make things a little more permanent, she chose to do that. She chose to move on to other mediums. She didn't do it because she felt pressured to do it from others. She did it because she herself wanted that. Yeah, that's a very pretty one. I like that. So my choice is The Keeper. I kind of feel where he's coming from. He, in this case, is someone who is the last person who observes the rules. But there's a sense that he is not so much a slave to the letter of these rules, He's concerned with the spirit of them, which is why he lets Mirabelle and Zack react as surrogates for Dorian, to let Dorian get checked in. And I think that's something that oftentimes gets overlooked in discussions of rules and systems. You get into this habit of thinking either system good or system bad. And neither one of these are particularly useful if you try and understand what the spirit of these rules is, what are the principles that guide the rulemaking, then you can actually come to proper decision-making. Because the rules are not exhaustive. They can't be. No matter how much you may map out a system for any and all eventualities, there will soon come your edge case that you didn't foresee. And so then you have to refer to the spirit what was the actual intent behind why the rule was created in the first place? Because they don't exist out of nothing. And I think we always have to be mindful of what are we really trying to get at when we think about rules that we live by, when we think about systems that we live in. These systems don't exist for their own sake, and they exist to be changed, and they exist to grow and evolve and they exist to be evaluated based on how well they maintain a set of adherence to principles. Those principles matter more than specific rules. To bring it back to our nerdiness and, you know, the way that we have lived by certain kinds of rules. If you think about games, there are certain types of tricks and exploits that people have found in video games that make it a better play experience that were not intended by the programmers and designers. Think about the rocket jump in... Oh. Quake. Yes, but no. Team Fortress. Team Fortress, yes. Think about the rocket jump in Team Fortress. It wasn't an intended thing by the developers and the game designers. It was found by the players took a system that existed, rules that existed, and found ways to use them to enhance gameplay. Think about how nearly everybody that I have 
ever talk to about Monopoly plays Monopoly. Does anyone actually play it by the actual rules? Nope. No. Especially not your sister. Your sister, who wants to extend the misery for everyone. Yeah, she wanted to play with UBI. <laughs> it was... <laughs> it wasn't good. She's like, but, but Will... I don't want you to stop playing with me. <laughs> I wanted the game to end. Anyway, moving on. That brings us into game experiences. Okay, you're first. So mine goes back to my first experience with online gaming. So this happened when I was in sixth grade. And prior to this, all of my experiences with games were strictly offline. So whether this was playing Super Nintendo or regular Nintendo or Game Boy, or what have you, or playing something on my PC. It was always strictly either single player or local multiplayer. So then one night, it was me, my friend Paul, and my friend Wes. We were over at Wes's place, and Wes's dad had just had a T1 line installed for his home office. So naturally, that meant that we could play games online. That meant that we could boot up Rise of the Triad, which was an ancient first-person shooter, sort of a spiritual sequel to Doom and Wolfenstein. I remember we got it all booted up. Because it was on a T1 line, it meant that we could have internet going and phone line at the same time. We called up our friend Tristan and got set up to play remotely. So suddenly we were playing Rise of the Triad with Tristan, who was not in the room with us. It was pretty amazing and magical. I also remember that night we watched Jurassic Park and we were completely hopped up on caffeine and sugar. And we just kept rewinding the scene where Samuel L. Jackson is going, hold on to your butts, <laughs> over and over again. <laughs> and it was just hilarious to us. And then, yeah, that was just something that was so weird to me. It was so strange to be playing something that I traditionally had thought of as a completely single player experience against a human opponent. It was very weird. And, uh, like, I wouldn't get a chance to do so at home until many years later when we got cable internet and actually had a computer capable of playing games. As we have explained before, that wasn't a priority for your parents. No, it really wasn't. <laughs> How about you? Speaking of your parents, we played Sushi Go with your parents. And it was the first time that you and I had played Sushi Go. And... We had actually brought a game that we love called Seven Wonders so that we could maybe play a game with them. And it turns out that Seven Wonders, which is incredibly complicated and super full and totally strategic and all of these things that kind of get me going, has the same drafting mechanic as Sushi Go, which is much more your parent's speed and led to a lot less frustration and a lot more enjoyment from all of us. Now, a lot of times I don't like learning new things in front of other people. It's part of my anxiety disorder. And I'm usually the first one to say, hey, I don't really want to do this in a group setting. I don't want to play a game with a whole bunch of people my first time out. It's my natural instinct is to just let everybody else play. But I played four player game and we got to talk about how they had learned it from your sister and they talked about how <laughs> your mom unintentionally screwed over our brother-in-law every round. <laughs> and it reminded me of how games can lead to just these emergent stories and this camaraderie and this feeling of connectedness. So much so that your sister is organizing an online group with your family on Zoom or some such, so that we can all play code names tonight. And I think it's a lovely experience in playing games together, even if you have to do it all separated and in four different houses. It's just such a lovely, connected feeling. I mean, even if you don't always enjoy making small talk with certain people that you get lumped into with a family event let's say. Playing a game with them gives you something 
to do in common that you can all enjoy together. Like, uh, I remember one time we brought Pandemic to a family Thanksgiving outing a few years ago. And I remember getting into that with my brother and having a good time with it and finding out that my brother is actually really good at that game. Yeah. But on top of that, it wasn't just your brother. It was your surrogate grandparents, your parents, us. Yeah. We knew the game, so we were able to help. But it was a lovely cooperative experience. I will not be bringing Pandemic to any other family social gatherings for a very long time. I wonder why. Yeah, about that. <laughs> yeah, and I'm wondering how many people who have played that game last January saw what was going on and was going, uh, 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 uh when it was a real global actual thing. Because I know I did. Yeah, I, I know that feeling. So let's segue on. So for our game recommendations this week, we're going to be talking about games that had strong emotional resonance for us. For me, I picked Mass Effect 3. I know this is a controversial pick and a lot of people didn't enjoy it. Which is a shame because it's a beautiful experience. But it actually really spoke to me during a time in my life where I was coping with feelings of failure and inadequacy. Because this is a game where you learn to fail. Everything you do fails. And it ultimately boils down to redefining what constitutes victory. Because your conventional goal gets thwarted pretty much at every turn. That really helped me through a tough spot in my life. I'm reminded of a Patrick Stewart quote as Jean-Luc Picard, where he says, it is possible to play a game perfectly and commit no errors and still lose. And that's not weakness, that's just life. And it helped me to forgive myself for failure, and it helped me to just come to terms with the fact that sometimes things aren't going to turn out the way I wanted them to. Will you tell the audience what the failure was, or what your perceived failure was? So this came out during a time when I was getting laid off from a job that I'd held for about five years at that point. And that was the longest I'd ever held a single job. And mind you, this was actually something where you got laid off through no fault of your own. The company moved. Yeah, there was nothing I could have done to prevent this. It had nothing to do with my performance or anything like that. And it felt cathartic to me to have an experience where, you know, in a video game, something wasn't turning out the way the characters had hoped and how they persevered and found a measure of peace, which I thought was really important. It was about savoring the time that you have with the ones you love and doing what you can to make sure that the world that comes after is good. And it's about these tough transitions. A lot of people didn't enjoy it, but I found it oddly moving. The entire thing just happened to speak to me where I was at that point in my life in a way that I don't think a more upbeat game would have. Or one where you necessarily come up against a victory condition. I liked Mass Effect 3's ending a lot. I thought it was beautiful and moving. And yeah, maybe it doesn't play to the power fantasy but I think it's more real that way. So yeah, that was my take. Uh, what's your emotional game recommendation? It's a game called Rhyme. I wanted to play it because it was beautiful art and there's a fox. That's literally all I knew about it. It's an indie game, gorgeous. The art style is just right up my alley. And it turns out that it's one of those indie games that's about grief or some shirt that Will is so fond of kind of ribbing me about. I'm not going to spoil most of what the game is about, but it takes a beautiful look at something that we believe about grief. By the end of that game, I was bawling my eyes out. There is a deep sense of companionship that you form between you and 
a robot of all, you know, it, it's not really even a robot. It's a non-sentient machine being that seems kind of menacing when you first meet it. There is beauty and light and expressions of anger and refusal of the call. It's about this little boy who is trapped on an island and trying to get off of the island. Trying to go home to his dad, ostensibly. I know I'm doing it no justice in describing. It has a lot of the elements that make me very happy about video games. One of the reasons I love Legend of Zelda is being able to collect all of the hidden stuff. It's one of the reasons I like games like Darksiders. It's that same collection element, that new experiences, new thing. It seems like you've discovered something that maybe not everyone has. Unless you're an achievement hunter. Hi. So it has a lot of those gameplay elements that just scratch that itch for me. But the story is told without dialogue so beautifully. And it took me a while to process it. The game can be played in an afternoon. I played through it twice because I wanted all the stuff. But the first time I played through it, it just all of the feels hit me in the face. And sometimes that, even if it's done heavy-handedly, which I don't believe that this one is, but sometimes that confrontation of grief that allows you to kind of empty all of it out through tears and snot, it's just what I need. I've had that happen with books. I've had that happen with movies. We recently watched the movie Soul and Damn You, Pixar, made me cry again, but there's something more visceral when it's a game. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's being participant in the world as opposed to just observer. It's because everything that happens is happening to you and not just in front of you. It allows you to internalize those feelings. Aspiring indie game designers, you heard it here first. If you make a game with pretty artwork and probably a fox or something, you have at least one guaranteed player. Yes, just let me know. <laughs> I'll buy that game as soon as it comes out. Probably in early access, even. Probably. So moving on, let's talk about our book recommendations. I'll let you kick it off this time. All right. My book recommendation this week is On a Sunbeam by Tilly Walden. Coincidentally, it's also the book that we chose for this year's winter solstice and next year's summer solstice book on our Patreon. It's a graphic novel that is a coming of age story set in space, but in a way that I've never experienced before. The art is striking and gorgeous. The story is a combination of a love story and found family. Again, those feelings of being together with people who love you. Our main character, Mia, feels lost and alone, untethered. And the setting of the entire book also feels untethered. It's ostensibly a sci-fi story, but it's also more accurate to say that it is about the characters and the feelings and the camaraderie and the connectedness. At the end, there's a lot more action. Will hasn't gotten there. But it has so much heart and it never loses sight of that. I really do recommend it to everybody. You'll probably find it in the YA section. There are a lot of really awesome YA books. All I gotta say. Yeah, I've enjoyed exploring it. It creates a very interesting science fiction universe that at the same time kind of feels like it could be a metaphor for just a person's experience of regular day-to-day -day life, just because the spaceships are strangely mundane. Although the outside of the spaceship looks like a betta fish. Yes. <laughs> and you get the sense that the buildings that they're going to, they're just regular buildings floating out in space. Like, we're at the school. It looks like a regular school, except it's just floating in space. 
you almost get the sense that it's a metaphor for how untethered Mia feels towards her life. And I'm not sure if that's an accurate depiction of what's actually happening in the story, but it's definitely a metaphorical thing that's happening as well. It's a really interesting way to look at the world. The relationships are sweet and heartbreaking and thoughtful. And I'm a sucker for people who love each other. I am also what you would call a friendship shipper. I love just seeing people being friends and friends of all kinds, whether that is romantic or platonic or, you know, just kind of that sibling love relationship, all kinds of friendship really make me happy. I like it when people are nice to each other. So what's your book recommendation this week? So this week I picked The Historian by Elizabeth Kostova. Okay, I love this book. Yeah. So I have in the past joked about Kvothe going to the university to study the Chandrian like someone who goes to college to learn about Draculas. Well, this is exactly that. The story comes to us in the form of an epistolary novel. It's a series of nested letters, first from a girl. Okay, hold on one second. Please define epistolary. So an epistolary novel is one that is told in the form of letters. So an example of this would be the original Dracula, which is told entirely in the form of correspondence between Mina Harker, Jonathan Harker, and Dr. Van Helsing. Thank you. In this case, the story is told through, first of all, letters from the principal protagonist who goes unnamed, her father, and her mother, as they trace the historical roots of Vlad the Impaler. So it has these elements that feel very realistic, like there's almost nothing fantastic about them, but the sense of place as we see Romania and Greece and Hungary and Poland all through these eyes of a child who's traveling with her father. And we also get a sense that the geopolitics are shifting in ways where perhaps the monster isn't really the vampire. Maybe the monster is these authoritarian regimes, whether they're right wing or left wing, that are springing up around the globe at that period in time. And it's all just this really compelling mix of mystery and wonder. There's periods where it's absolutely terrifying, even though nothing more suspenseful is happening than someone reading a book. What I absolutely love is that the audiobook is so well done. The people who are the readers do such a good job. A good audiobook relies upon its readers. And there have been some audiobooks that are just not good or phoned in. I'm sure that that's where a lot of people get turned off of listening to books rather than reading them. But in this case, I just felt entranced by listening to all of the letters being read aloud. Yeah, I remember when I first read it, it was... October of 2005, it was the night of Halloween. I had just had a job interview. It was for my first job out of college. And I wanted to treat myself to something. So I went to the local borders back when that was still a thing. And I picked up a copy of The Historian. And then I went home and then just started reading all the way through. <laughs> you just dated us on the whole, oh God, it was borders. Yeah. So... There I was, Halloween night, reading this book. And of course, the peril of trying to do anything on your own on the night of Halloween is trick-or-treaters. So I remember having to brusquely shoo away trick-or-treaters by offering pearls of wisdom rather than candy, a gift that is literally priceless. Soon word got around and they never bothered me so I could just continue reading my book. You didn't buy candy that year? I did not. I mean, we haven't bought candy in a long time because we don't get trick-or-treaters, but... Yeah. Also, we make a habit of not being around for trick-or-treaters. Yeah, that too. But it was a lot of fun just for me to sit down and read that book. It, it really fit the mood and the place. And it transported me in ways that I really felt like I needed at that time. 
All right. So on that note, I think it's time for us to share our quotes. You first. I picked one from Mirabelle. Caffeine is an important weapon in my arsenal. <laughs> oh, it's eight words. <laughs> I wanted it to be seven words because that would be hilarious, but... Yeah, I don't do well before I've had my coffee, typically. No. And I find that, that on most mornings after I've had my coffee, I do way better, just in general. And there's also something about the smile you get when I bring coffee for you. I really do appreciate our weekends where you buy me coffee and bring it home with breakfast. It's one of those things that has kept us grounded and it still feels normal. Every weekend you buy us coffee and breakfast and there's only so much I think we could take if we didn't have some sense of normalcy. In the mornings... Monday through Friday, we kind of <laughs> have a routine of watching Good Mythical Morning and then making ourselves drip coffee, except right now we're out of the coffee I like, so I'm having tea. But there is something comical about zombie you before you've had your coffee. Yeah, I uh, I often have a very hard time. I'm, I'm going on autopilot, typically. Yeah, the ADD does not mix well with being slightly awake no it's not fun i'm in this state of a haze pretty much just barely aware of what i'm doing and anything that i can pawn off on an automatic process i do yeah well hmm. <laughs> which makes you good at changing kitty litter in the morning one of my gifts <laughs> i have a very particular set of skills and changing cat litter is sometimes one of them yep Okay, well, I have two quotes, one that's extremely long, which is probably not the one that I'm going to make an Instagram post of, and the other one is a lot shorter, and once I get around to making a background for the Starless Interlude, sorry, I haven't done that yet, I've been lazy, but <laughs> the first one, the long one, the stories did not remain to be questioned and criticized and second-guessed by herself or others. They were, and then they were not. Many were never read before they ceased to exist, but the story sculptor remembered them. And I like that because I like the fleeting nature of a story that may never have been read. Something that is written not so that others can read it, but so that it can leave the storyteller's head. That's pretty beautiful. And then the other is the one that I'm going to make a pretty little background for. For who would leave their home once they had found it? I like that one. Even if you find it strange how someone else has created or found a home, even if you find the home to be odd or not to your liking or off in just some way. It's not for you to judge. It's for the person who lives that life, who found that home, to decide that that is what makes them happy, what makes them satisfied and feel comfort. Our home is full of our comforts. We are in a room that is one of the most our home in our house. It's full of musical instruments, stuffed animals, and Lego. This is one of my favorite rooms in the house. If only the cats could be in here, but they can't be trusted. So I'm stuck with a stuffed animal, like my permaids, or the little skell animal green lantern panda. And this is also the room that guests sleep in if they get to come over. And it is aggressively our room. There is Star Wars stuff all over this room, on the walls. In the bookcase. And it's just... ha, huh, I love it. I love being in here too. And, you know, I was kind of thinking about your quote too. For me, home is not really a specific place. It's the people I'm with. And when I'm with you, I'm home. Why would I leave? One thing that I have learned about us during the pandemic, we still find comfort in each other's presence. Even as 
we are literally stuck together. <laughs> There's nowhere else to go, really. Not safely. And we keep coming back to one another. We still do this every week. And we still find comfort together. It's not something I've had historically. There are people that I have lived with before that I could not survive a pandemic quarantine with. Two very not nice people. And I think my lucky stars every single day that the person that I am constantly with is someone that makes me smile and feel loved and comfortable, who wants to be around me, you're pretty much the only person I interact with in person. Well, I'm glad that you're able to be my one person I see in person. You're my in-person person. person. (laughs) I'm glad that you're my in-person person. I'm glad that you're my in-person person. And with that, I'd like to thank you for potting with me. Thank you for potting with me. And thank you for listening to Tales from the Waystone. Join us in two weeks on Tales from the Waystone, a starless interlude, where we will be covering pages 251 through 327 of the U.S. paperback edition of The Starless Sea. And special thanks to our friend Shawnee Jang for our theme music. And to Aaron Morgenstern for creating this wonderfully beautiful starless sea that we have enjoyed our voyage upon. Writing and project management, courtesy of me, Will McCullough. Audio production, editing, and social media coordination, courtesy of me, Phoenix McCullough. If you'd like to help support our endeavors here, our own voyages on this starless sea, please consider becoming a patron on our Patreon page at patreon.com slash waystonepod. There you'll find access to show notes, early access to our episodes, Patreon-exclusive bonus pods, as well as other fun goodies. And with that, here's to one more day above the roses to one more day above the roses. Ding! Ding. doop de doop de doop Airplane. 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 We had to mix it up. Just a little.